Hi everybody, this is Cheryl. I'm Cheryl Richardson. I always want to say this is Cheryl. It's like, I'm Cheryl Richardson. Hi, I'm um, here for the first time in a couple of weeks. It's been a couple of weeks since I've done a Facebook Live. I've been like really busy and the last month I spent uh, Mondays doing Facebook Live on uh, Louise Hayes Facebook page. So can you hear the birds out there? <laughs> I have um, all of these red-winged blackbirds out there that are yelling to me. They want more food. Hi, Sarah and Rebecca. Welcome. And Terry. Hi, Terry. So, um, so yeah, I'm here, and we're kind of in the middle of a thunderstorm. Um, it's lightning out, and every now and then you'll hear a rumble of thunder. Hi, Rachel and Sheila. Welcome. And, um, and Pia, welcome. Hi from San Diego and Jessica. So every now and then you'll hear a rumble of thunder. Um, I don't think you'll see a flash of lightning and hopefully, hopefully the uh, lights stay on. It's our first thunderstorm of the season, first thunderstorm this spring. So I love that. Um, hi, Michelle and Lori and Sarah and, and um, Susan and Teresa and Deborah. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. And Terry. Um, so it's spring and it's uh, everything's popping here in the Northeast. Yesterday I had my first hummingbird of the season. My sister Carrie gave me a hummingbird feeder which I've never used before. I've only used plants um, but it's too early to plant anything here. So um, uh, she gave me this this hummingbird feeder. Hi Shelly, hi Joel, hi Carol. And um, so I made, you know, went online, got the recipe for hummingbird food, which is sugar and water, boiled, and um, went ahead and filled the feeder. And yesterday I was sitting out on the deck in the afternoon after working all day, and all of a sudden I heard that unbelievable, uh, it sounds like a jet engine, a little tiny jet engine, and the next thing I know, there's a hummingbird at the feeder. I'm like, yes, because you know once they find them, they're going to come back. And sure enough, he came back um, several times while I was sitting there reading. So it was a, a banner day for me. I always love seeing hummingbirds and it's wonderful to have a feeder um, so that I can see them now. So anyway, hi Sarah and Christine and Lisa from Florida. I love that, um, Lisa Neptune from Florida. I think that's funny. <laughs> Anki, welcome, and Debbie. I'm glad you liked my summit talk. And hi Anne from Glasgow. Haven't been there in a long time. Hi, Donna. Thank you so much for the beautiful gift that you sent me, Donna. You crack me up. Ranunculus, ranunculus bulbs. I'm so excited. Hi, Jasmine from Cape Town. And Phyllis and Anne and Christine and Diane from British, from Vancouver, BC, British Columbia. So glad to have you all here with me. Um, so what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about I'm going to talk about something for just a couple minutes like I usually do and then I'll take your questions and provide some live coaching. So Sunday was Mother's Day here in the United States. I know it's not the same day for everybody. And um, we took my mom to see a movie. So me and all my sisters, I'm one of five sisters and um, the five of us and my couple of nieces and um, one of my sister-in-laws we all took mom to the movies. Okay, guys, be quiet. Can you hear them? I, I don't know if you can hear them yelling. <laughs> anyway, so we all took her to see the new Melissa McCarthy movie, the comedy. I love Melissa McCarthy. I think she's hysterical. And we took her to um, one of those really kutchy theaters that have the nice, comfortable seats, and they serve you food. And um, so we, you know, we're a big family. So we took over one whole section and um, sat and had something to eat and watched the movie together and had some good laughs. And, you know, when I left it, I, as I was driving home, it had been a tough morning for me um, before then because, you know, I was thinking about my little guy, Poupon, and how, you know, that, how for some of us that don't have children, our animals become this, give us this wonderful opportunity to stretch our mothering muscles. And so having Poupon um, certainly felt like having a little a little being who needed my mothering and my care and so to not have him here was really it was kind of a tough morning so it was good to go and see a comedy and um, when I left when I was driving home I thought 
boy, you know, comedy is so underrated. Like, it's not something I think about. I mean, as you all know, I'm a huge fan of grieving and cr having a good cry and um, doing what you need to do to allow yourself to feel your feelings when you're um, having a difficult time. And um, that's certainly very important to me. And at the same time, you don't want to live there. As my friend Russ Hudson says, you don't want to dive into the emotional fondue and stay there. You're supposed to dip in, feel the feelings, and then come back out, right? And um, sometimes, because I'm sort of temperamentally melancholy, um, it's easy for me to dive in <laughs> and stay there, not come out. So um, sometimes comedy is a really great way to pull yourself out of the emotional fondue. And that was really, that was helpful for me to do that on Sunday, to laugh and to hear my mother laugh. <laughs> She's so cute. There were so many parts that she really liked. And it, so I drove home thinking about the importance of laughing, the importance of, um, you know, just exercising the funny bone, giving ourselves the gift of a good belly laugh. So I wonder, you know, how many people in your life do you hang out with that actually make you laugh? I know my husband, Michael, makes me laugh. Uh, he says that's why he's in my life, and it's a big part of why he's in my life. He's a cartoonist, and he's got a crazy sense of humor, so almost every morning I wake up to some kind of funny cartoon he sent me in the middle of the night that usually makes me laugh. Sometimes it makes me cringe because he does really crazy things, really wild cartoons, but he's always making me laugh, and um, especially when I'm really serious and intense, which I can be like that more often than not. So seeing funny movies, going to comedy shows. Michael and I have a good friend, his name's Paul D'Angelo, and he's a nationally known comedian. He's hysterical, one of these very clean, smart, funny guys. And um, we love to see him. Sometimes we'll go to his show, seeing funny movies, as I said. Um, my all time, one of my all time favorite funny movies is um, Liar Liar with Jim Carrey. Have you ever seen that? I watched that movie over and over again when I was writing Stand Up For Your Life because I was struggling with one part and I kept just putting in that video, this was back when there were videotapes, and I would just watch it over and then the bloopers at the end of Liar Liar are, are just hysterical, they're fantastic. So watching funny movies, hanging out with people who make you laugh. There have been people in my life where I know when we get together, um, they are going to invite the humorous part of me out. She needs to be invited out. She doesn't just live, you know, she's not always just present for me. A lot of times I need somebody to kind of riff off of or to, um, you know, somebody who, who inspires me to kind of exercise that muscle of humor. My assistant Lisa is very funny. She has a great sense of humor. I think it's one of her best gifts. I don't know if she knows that, but pretty much every time I'm with her, she makes me laugh and I appreciate that. Boy, it's pouring rain out there. So anyway, I wonder about, um, I wonder about when the last time you laughed was. How often do you laugh? Do you have people in your life who make you laugh? Um, do you make a point of watching comedies or uh, watching funny television shows? You can even, I mean, I actually, before I started doing this, this Facebook Live, I went online and I Googled funny jokes. And like there's this, there's all these websites with really funny, um, like all different variety of jokes. You can get clean jokes, you can get dirty jokes. What does it say here? Um, new jokes, kids jokes, marriage jokes. All right, so let's see. Let's see. Um, I'm going to tell you a joke off of here. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the optimist says, oh, this, this, is, this cracks me up. I can totally identify with this. The optimist says the gla glass is half full. The pessimist says the glass is half empty. And mother says, why didn't you use a coaster? <laughs> now that's something I would probably say. Um, a, guest, a guest calls the waiter and complains, how come there are no chairs at our table? The waiter shrugs, I'm sorry, but you only booked one table. Okay, it's a little funny. Um, I've been really depressed lately. A friend told me I should go to a petting zoo, perhaps, to cheer up. I went today, but not one person would stroke me. 
Okay, I'm going to stop there. But there are places there are places online where you can get really funny jokes. So I wonder what kind of funny movies you've seen that you really love. I'm just going to sort of go through here. Um, what funny movies you've seen or funny TV shows that you really appreciate? Uh, yeah, let's see. Have you seen Liar Liar? I wonder about that. And, um, and yeah, let's see. Yeah, somebody says, I'm picky at comedy. I need to get better at this. Um, yeah, some people are natural comedians. Okay, so Lisa says, my daughter, who's a natural comedian, um, she's coming home next month from being gone three years in the Peace Corps. Wow. Wow, that's great. I bet you're so excited about that, huh, Lisa? That's awesome. So speaking of, um, you know, people who are just natural comedians, my sister Michelle, who I think is still on here, is a natural comedian. And um, she's hysterical. And when we were together on Sunday after the movies, she was telling what I thought was going to be a heart-wrenching story about having to put her dog down, which she needed to do just not that long ago, a few, you know, a few weeks ago. And um, uh, so she tells this crazy story about having to, about like rushing to get to the, um, the, the vet. The dog was at the vets and she needed to rush to get the, she starts telling this story about getting stopped by the police with her kids in the car and crying and not being able to talk. And by the end of it, like we're all hysterical laughing. Like it just would have made an unbelievable, I told her, you should totally go to an open mic night and tell that story once you're kind of beyond the grieving period. It made me laugh so hard just listening to her. She's just naturally very, very funny. So yeah, Robin Williams, a lot of people mentioning him. He was just such a master and you can watch great videos of his. Stephen Colbert is also funny. His monologues are very funny. Um, Maria says, I've been re-watching the Sybil series on Amazon Prime. Christine Baranski is priceless. I love her. She's really funny. I've been watching um, The Good Fight. Has anybody seen The Good Fight? It's the takeoff after The Good Wife. And um, she's in that, and it's just awesome. It's really an awesome show. So anyway, I just wanted to start by saying how important it is to give your funny bones a workout. It's good for the body. It's good for your mind. It's good for your heart. It's a wonderful way to take a break if you're grieving or going through a difficult time. You know, we need to give ourselves rest periods from the, uh, the experience of grieving or the experience of being frustrated. I mean, anything. If you're going through a court case or a divorce or dealing with illness. Remember Norman Cousins who really healed himself by watching funny movies every day? It releases feel-good chemicals into the body, floods them with that. It lowers cortisol, which are the, you know, the hormone that, the stress hormones that make, make, you know, make it difficult to sleep, make us retain fat, make us feel anxious. So it's a great remedy, a really wonderful self-care remedy, and I hope that you'll do something, um, do something fun with that this week. Just make, you know, make humor more of a priority in your life. Okay. So now I'm going to take about 15 minutes to answer any questions you might have to offer some coaching. So, um, <laughs> Chris, you are too funny. Okay. Let me just say this. So Chris here types, how do you make a hormone? Okay. <laughs> I've heard that joke before, but what's really funny about that, Chris, and this is, you know, my husband, Michael, who I know still hasn't called you. Sorry, sweetheart. Um, Chris, you're so funny. Michael's always complaining that I'm really literal when it comes to jokes. You know, he'll tell, he'll show me his writing where he's got something funny in there and I'm like not laughing. And he's like, well, didn't you get the joke? And I'm like, what joke? He's like, oh, you've got to be kidding me. You didn't get the joke? Because I take things so literally. So when I read your, your question, Chris, I'm like, hmm, how do you make a hormone? That's interesting. <laughs> Took me a minute. I'm so literal. Anyway, yes, Diane, we want ourselves to be mar marinating in feelings that feel good. It's very good for the body. Um, so, uh, oh, this is great. So Emily says, this is just information for you based on what I've learned from professionals in my health industry personally. When you have PTSD, some damage is temporary and some is permanent. 
So it's not always a choice. Okay, this is in response to somebody's question, I guess. Anyway, all right. Um, so let me know if you have any questions or if you want to mention a funny movie that you love. Um, I think Lisa mentioned the Pink Panther movies, which is great. Another vote for Colbert. People love him. Peter Sellers, yeah, he's really wonderful. Blazing Saddles, do you know, Carol, I've never seen that movie. Michael has, but I've never seen it. I think I heard that there was farting in it, and I thought, okay, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm just not doing that. Oh, my God. Speaking of farting, can I just say, this is an example of my husband, Michael. So this morning, I go up, and I was talking to him about something, and all of a sudden, I hear this weird noise, and I'm like, what is that? He said, oh, I just changed the, um, the ring on my phone to a fart noise. I said, what? He said, yeah, every time I get a text or a chime, it sounds like a fart. I said, why did you do that? He said, because I knew it would drive you crazy and it would make you laugh. You're supposed to laugh. <laughs> then I laughed. But I'm like, you know, who does that? Can you imagine being at a meeting and all of a sudden having that happen? Ooh, it kind of freaks me out a little bit. That wouldn't be good. Anyway, yes, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, Life of Brian by Monty Python. Okay, Erica, so Michael can pretty much recite every Monty Python movie like there ever was, like verbatim. He and his brothers, they grew up watching it. Um, so Barbara says, this is actually frightening for me to realize I've forgotten about laughing. Yeah, right? I know. I know, this is what I mean. We've got to make laughter more of a priority. I would say, just like we're talking about eating well and exercising and breathing and sleeping, getting good sleep, if you think about the last time you laughed, and if you can't remember, then it's definitely been too long. But if you think about the last time you laughed, you'll remember how good it felt. You know, you'll remember that you just really... It's like a full body experience. It's really wonderful. And you can, you, you just, you know, it's, you just know that it's really good for you when you do it. Um, okay, so Carol's saying, I have to watch Blazing Saddles. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, Lost in America. I know, Tanya, can you believe it? I'm glad somebody, I'll let Michael know you thought it was funny that he has a fart noise for a phone ring. Um, believe me, he's not going to have it for very long. But he did it today just to just to tease me. This is what he does. Um, young Frankenstein, yeah, that's a good one. Yes, Joel, the whole world is too serious. No, Angela, did I get another cat yet? No, it's just not time. I, you know, I miss, I so miss having an animal because I love having animals, but I just am not ready yet. I can feel that I'm just not ready. Um, I just, I just want, want it to be Poupon, and so I'm still in the grieving process, but believe me, I'm going to get two, not just one, but two. Michael's, I don't know if he's on board with that or not, but I'm going to, um, um, I'm going to see what I can do about that. Okay, let's see, questions. Margaret, hard question, but I really want more good friends, real friends, not just acquaintances, People who relate to me and want to do fun things with me. There are dating sites, but where are their friend sites? Um, yeah, that's um, a really, really good question, Margaret. I'll tell you something. This weekend, I'm hosting my retreat. It's a retreat I do twice a year. It has become one of the best ways to make new, like-minded soul family members. I mean, I've been doing retreats for over 15 years, used to do them at Miraval. Now I've been doing them, you know, locally, just north of me in York, Maine. And um, probably the most, the greatest benefit, I would say, out of the investment of time and money is that you meet people that you stay connected with probably for the rest of your life. I have some people that went to my Miraval retreat 15 years ago who continue to see each other. Um, so I say that, Margaret, because finding places to go where people who share your values is a good start. I also work out at a local gym. It's a small gym. It's a hard gym. It's a CrossFit gym. So you've got to be really committed if you're going to go. And if you're going to stay, you're really committed. And one of the things I really love about that gym 
is that I've met people who truly value health, working out, staying in good shape, getting strong, and because we share that value, as I've gotten to know people, I've discovered that we share other values as well. And um, I've had, I go out and get smoothies with two gals, Beth and Eleanor, who I work out with. One who's older than I am, you know, one's about a decade older and one's a decade younger, maybe even more than a decade younger, maybe two decades, two, 20 years younger. But we just all really like each other and we get along well. And um, it's because I, went someplace consistently, that's also the thing. So if there's a yoga class that you like to go to, um, although the problem with yoga classes is there's, there's depending on the kind of class, there's not a lot of interaction. Um, same thing with meditation classes, you know, you need some place where there's ongoing interaction. And I always think it's great to find a place where there's physical movement if you can. You can use something like Meetup. Maybe there are people in your community who would love to walk on a regular basis and could use somebody to walk with. Um, maybe, you know, if you play cards or play chess or some kind of game. Um, think about what it is that's important to you, what you value, the top three things, let's say, that you value. And then ask yourself, where would people like you typically go? Now, if you're more of an introvert, that question's not going not gonna to provide you with the answers you need. So then you want to ask yourself, where would extroverted versions of me go? And then you may need to actually challenge yourself to step out of your comfort zone, um, Margaret, and do some things consistently. When I joined the CrossFit gym, the first three months, I was like, what am I doing here? I'm out of my mind. This is crazy. Um, you know, these people are in way better shape than I am. They're doing exercises I've never done before, but I made myself do the opposite of what I'd normally do. Hang in there, smile, meet people, say hello, and I'm so glad I did. That was over two years ago. It's almost two and a half years now, and I've been so consistent, and I love the people there. I really do. So I hope that, um, I hope that that's helpful. Yeah. All right. Lots of great... Um, uh, Lots of great um, uh, funny movie suggestions here. So make sure you go back through and look at the, um, yeah. So somebody just, I noticed, walk the mall. I used to do that years ago. I walked the mall with somebody. Go to a mall, start walking the mall every day at the same time, and say hi to people that you meet. Make a point of saying hi to some of the people that work there. You might meet somebody. You'd be surprised. Life loves you and life wants to bring you new good friends. We just got to put ourselves out in the world consistently so that we can actually see them when they're there. Andy says, I'm dealing with thyroid nodules, biopsy next week. What is this disease energetically? Well, first of all, Andy, let me say to you, having worked with people who have had exactly that, nodules on their thyroid, who have had the thyroid removed or part of the thyroid removed only to discover that the nodules were benign, really regretted having the surgery. So I'm not saying that's the wrong thing to do, but I am saying this. Anytime you're dealing with the thyroid, which regulates the whole, so many systems of the body, it's like, it's like one of the main engines, you wanna make sure that you see either a naturopath or a functional medicine doctor, somebody who understands the whole system of the body. I talk about this all the time when I'm doing workshops, Facebook Lives. I'm a big, big proponent of doctors who don't just deal with the thyroid or the endocrine system, but deal with the whole body and the way the thyroid reacts to, interacts with the whole body. So you can Google for a naturopath, which is a doctor that studies the effects of nutrition and lifestyle and stress and hormones and all of that. Um, a doctor, whoa, that was big lightning. Doctor who studies um, the whole body, a naturopath. If you Google for a naturopath locally, you'll find one. Or a functional medicine doctor, holistic physician, sometimes they're called. But somebody who is going to help you to really look at your thyroid in relation to your whole body, not as a separate organ. We can't, we, we have to move out of this medical model where we're just searching for which organs messed up and needs to be like fixed or removed. We need to like make sure that there aren't other things going on that are causing the nodules that can be addressed if in fact they're benign. So it's, it's not uncommon, I've actually heard about it a lot. 
And um, please, please, please make sure you get a second opinion before you do any kind of surgery. That would be great. Connie loves making other people laugh. That's good. We need more people like you, Connie. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. John wants to know, turning my temporary time of unemployment to fun employment. I love that phrase. Having fun looking at new opportunities and exploring new chapters. And things are unfolding in wonderful ways. Oh, and the Golden Girls always makes me laugh. The Golden Girls always makes me laugh. If I happen to catch it on television, man, that was some really good comedy, wasn't it, John? And I love that you're, um, you're number one, seeing your unemployment as temporary. That's really smart that you're calling it fun employment, and that you're looking at new opportunities, I think it's extremely important. You know, it's one of the things I talk about in Waking Up in Winter is there's, we reach a point in life where we've mastered so many things, and we've mastered even the roles that we take on, and it's time for us to begin expressing new and different parts of ourselves, And that means trying on new things. And then when we do that, life starts to unfold in wonderful ways just like you're saying. So good luck to you, John. And keep affirming, the perfect job finds me. That was one of Louise's favorite affirmations. Um, yes, Teresa says, giving a new kitty the same wonderful life is honoring your lost love, without a doubt. And I know that to be true. It's just like this. It's sort of like, you know, if a child died, I couldn't just replace a child. Or if, my, God forbid, Michael died, I couldn't just replace him. You know, I, I, you, you need time to kind of be with your grief. And, um, and at some point, we will give a really wonderful home to two kitties, at least two, maybe more. Wouldn't that be awesome? Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, good. Um, oh, this is great. Carol says she joined a meetup group for widows, and she's now developed a nice group of friends. I love that. I love that. That's really terrific. And um, so those of you that are interested in making new friends, find groups where you have something in common. Book groups. Do you know how many book groups I've talked to since Waking Up in Winter came out? I've had the pleasure of meeting with people virtually, and I'm, I'm actually gonna do more of that because it's been so much fun, meeting with people virtually, and so many of these women started out just reading books together and have become really close friends talking about all kinds of life stuff. So um, book groups, you could start your own book group, and you could start with you know people at work, asking anybody in work if they'd like to join, or picking a couple of friends and asking them to invite somebody that, um, that you don't know, that they know. That could also be a great thing to do. All right, I love Lucy, people love that. Um, Barbara wants to know, how can you find a good retreat that's affordable? I guess it depends on what kind of retreat you're talking about, Barbara. But um, first of all, start affirming that you can afford a really good retreat that's priced more than you think you can afford. Just start affirming that. Secondly, you might want to offer to volunteer or to um, see if places have scholarships. We always have people that contact us about my retreats, and we always have at least one or two guests at the retreat. Um, so, you know, you, if you find something that you really like, don't just assume that you can't afford it. You might have something else to exchange. Maybe you're a massage therapist and you want to exchange massage or... Um, <laughs> you know, maybe you have, maybe you do, you do yoga and you want to offer yoga. So um, you definitely want to, you want to be open. And then, you know, there are some places off season. Sometimes you can go someplace to, um, uh, you know, uh, a retreat. Like I think about the, the place where we do our retreats. Off season, they have better rates than the heavy season, of course, and sometimes you can just make up a simple retreat for yourself by going off season to a hotel and making sure that you get a massage and um, having quiet time to yourself. Or maybe you use Airbnb, which I mean, so many people I know get really wonderful, sweet places for very little money. You can make up your own retreat that way and it doesn't have to cost a lot. Okay, so let's see. Um, yeah, Kelly says her workout club is filled with great supportive women and it's changed her life. I love that. Um, yeah, good. So, Margaret, you've made one friend at yoga. That's good. 
Awesome. Okay. Yeah, Tanya, I am badass. <laughs> she says, wow, you do CrossFit. That's so badass. You know what? It is really badass. And in the beginning, I thought, there's no way I can stay and do this. And now I love it. This morning, I was doing sumo deadlifts and I was like deadlifting 125 pounds easily. When I started out, I was lucky if I could deadlift, you know, 90 pounds and I can actually deadlift 175 pounds. I love deadlifts. <laughs> they happen to be one of my favorite. Um, so yeah, I, I've officially earned the title of badass, but I'm nothing like a lot of the women and men in the gym, what they do, but I'm badass for me. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, Ingrid says, question. I just finished my studies and now I'm going out in the world, but I just don't have any idea of what I want to be doing. I feel like I'm standing in front of doors I have to walk into, but I have no idea and even no feeling of which door I prefer. How can I help? How can I help myself to find answers to what I want to do? And also, how do I find the patience to listen to what I want when I don't hear anything? Yeah. So that's part of it, Ingrid, is being patient enough to just be with yourself. Sometimes, I'm going to give you an odd answer, but sometimes the most beneficial thing we can do is to just pick a door, walk through, get a job, and get started. And decide that you're going to try something to see if you like it. What that does is it gets the energy moving, it builds momentum, it says to life, I'm here, I'm ready, I'm, go I'm out there, I'm like putting myself out there, I'm ready to, you know, I'm ready to use my talents and gifts. I wonder what you studied. Are you talking about college or are you talking about, uh, I'm assuming you're talking about secondary education. What topic did you study and why? I mean, that's got to hold some clues as to what might be next for you. Also, um, Ingrid, if you send an email to um, Nicole at CherylRichardson.com, so Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, I'll send you a digital version of um, Finding Your Passion, which is an audio program I did for Hay House uh, several years ago. And that could be really helpful in helping you to determine what it is you feel passionate about and which direction. Don't look for the right direction, the perfect direction, the next thing. Just choose something, throw yourself into it, and let life show you what's next. Okay, let's see. Yes, um, lots of good, you guys are so helpful to each other, it's really wonderful. Um, Connie says, when I'm trying to eat better, I do okay to, uh, until around this time, then I tend to go into some type of trance and make bad decisions. My company provides tons of snacks and sodas. I hate that, that companies do that. How can I wake myself up before I make bad choices? Haven't found anything that works. Hmm. So, Connie, the first thing I wonder is, is there a dip in energy that you are trying to feed to lift yourself up? Because you're talking about all these carbs. And it's really hard at work. Could you ask people around you to not put any kind of... Um, Snacks near you, number one, so could you set some boundaries around that? Like, hey, I don't want, you can bring food, keep it in your desk, but I don't want it out for me. That would be one thing to do. I would also notice, um, bring some protein with you so that you can put protein into your body just before five o'clock, that might help. I'd also start journaling. You know what I'd do, Connie, is take a little pad of paper and leave it near you, maybe at your desk. And just before that time rolls around, I want you to just write down how you're feeling. You know, Janine Roth's work, uh, Women, Food, and God, is a wonderful book, and she talks about really looking at the foods, when we turn to food when we're not hungry, so that we can discover why. And um, noticing how you feel before you do it is really important. And here's one thing I bet you feel, bored. Bored, unfed tired, drained. Whenever we get stuck in a bad habit, particularly at the same time every day, what's happening is we're plugging into a neural network. Connie, I want you to hear this. We're plugging into a neural network and we are entrained to our environment. So in other words, everything has trained us to expect to want this food at five, see the food at five, smell the food at five, walk over to the food at five, taste one Cheeto or Dorito or whatever it is, 
and then want another. It's like, it is a trance. You're wise in recognizing. Neural networks get plugged in. These are just, it's like a groove. A record kicks in. The record kicks in and suddenly it's like, take me to the Doritos. <laughs> take me to the Doritos. That's what happens. One of the best ways to break a neural pattern is to do something different at that time. So make yourself get up and go for a walk. I don't know if, I'm assuming you're still at work because you're seeing this stuff. Um, get up and do something different. Start breaking that pattern so that you don't, so you, you break the trance is essentially what you're doing. Get up and walk to another side of the building. Go take the stairs, do two or three or four flights of stairs. The minute you move your body, differently you start breaking that pattern um, I wouldn't trust yourself to just sit at your desk and go okay I'm not gonna have the peppermint patties I'm gonna eat peanut you know eat almonds or something that's not enough you actually have to get up and move and change change the rhythms and the routines of that time period so that you don't get pulled right back into that trance try those things I think that that might be helpful and I'll be curious to hear how things go let me know okay um, Oh, Sheila, stay safe. Tornado warnings where you are. Um, okay. Well, listen, I'm going to wrap it up because it's. I know I've kind of gone on long here, and I actually do need to check our weather too. Um, but I want to say thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. I'm off to our retreat this weekend. We have a full house. I'm teaching with Russ Hudson, who's the expert on the Enneagram, the personality typing system that is really quite profound. I encourage you to check it out. I write about it in Waking Up in Winter. Um, and I'm going to see if I can corral Russ to do another retreat with me, uh, probably in April of next year. So if you miss this one, you'll have another chance. Hopefully, fingers crossed, I think it'll work. Um, but in the meantime, have a wonderful week. And um, I won't be doing a Facebook Live next week because I've got to travel to New Orleans to give a speech. But I will be back the following week, unless I do one from the road, which is a possibility. Ooh, lots of lightning. All right. Can you hear the thunder? That's like right overhead. Okay. All right, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So glad to be with you. Have a wonderful week and I'll see you again soon. All right. Bye.